And I will ha directly hand over to uh, Creative Commons CEO, Catherine Styler to address us some uh, welcome remarks. Catherine, over to you. Oh, thanks, Brigitte. That is very quick and efficient of you <laughs> and, and lovely to welcome everyone. Um, it's so great that you could spend time with us today. Um, and it's great to, to um, just to have this wealth of experience that you all have to discuss uh, this topic um, as we as we think about the actions we take. And as many of you know, CC is a non-profit organization dedicated to promoting better sharing of culture and knowledge in the public interest. And we manage the licenses and public domain tools that not only help creators share content, but also help institutions share their collections. So we count on a dynamic international network of lawyers, activists, and also your good selves uh, to move policy forward on topics that matter to everyone. Our open culture program is geared towards increasing and improving access and sharing of cultural heritage. And one important program component is policy. The rules that govern sharing really need improving as we all know, because they are not in line with the digital environment that we're existing within today. At Creative Commons, we truly believe in the power of open access to cultural heritage. And this type of better sharing, as we see it, helps build and sustain vibrant and thriving communities. Glams are gateways, pivotal points between heritage and the public. Preserving and sharing collections is at the heart of their mission, your mission. So many cultural heritage institutions have opened their collections, but many more face insurmountable barriers mainly due to an inadequate policy environment. So to better understand these barriers as part of the CC copyright platform, we've developed a draft policy paper towards better sharing of cultural heritage, which many of you have been involved in, in shaping and thank you for your efforts and guidance on this. Um, and so this serves really as a, as a reference point for how we are looking at this as part of our community advocacy work in copyright reform in the cultural heritage context. So um, this is a starting point, this guide that has been shared with all of you. And as I say, some of you have been really pivotal in, in informing that guide. And so we start today, not in a vacuum, but with a yeah, guide to, to, to steer us forward course. and, and they look forward to how, how we do that. So without much further ado, um, we've got a great panel of speakers this morning and also a great group of yourselves who will contribute to the debate and discussion. I really look forward to hearing what you all have to say and working with you, not just today, but in the weeks, months, years ahead, as we embark on this programme of change and looking at that policy landscape that we know is not working and we need to change for the better. Thanks, Brigitte, and thanks to you and Camille for putting this on and all the work and Kat as well for all your hard work in doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for um, addressing us uh, with these warm welcome words. Um, I'm very um, grateful. I think it's wonderful that so many of you have showed up to our um, to our workshop today. So uh, I'll introduce myself before getting a, ahead of myself. Um, my name is Brigitte Vizna, and I'm the director of policy and open culture at Creative Commons. And I really hope that you will take this opportunity to really share your perspectives and, and your thoughts about what matters to you, uh, especially when we go to the more interactive part of the program later on. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that, but it's great that you're here to not only listen to our great panelists, but I think bring also a lot of your wisdom and inspiration as we, um, as we develop this guide. And I'll say a, a bit more about that later too. So um, at this stage, I just want to say that this workshop is the culmination of several months of collaboration, especially within our, our coordination group. Um, and I want to um, thank especially uh, the four members, uh, Emine Yildirim, uh, Martin Zeinstra, uh, Shanna Hollich, and Camille Francoise, who um, will be leading the breakout sessions later in the program, and, and Martin will, will brief us more on, uh, on this point after the panel. But I want to say at this point that their ideas and their work have really shaped not, not only this event, but also our vision beyond the workshop to really um, come up with a community-driven co-creation process for uh, our policy guide. 
And the main goal of this event is to kick off that collaborative process of drafting a practical guide for policymakers that is based on the paper that Catherine just mentioned that was released recently uh, entitled Towards Better Sharing of Cultural Heritage and Agenda for Copyright Reform. So I'd like to give you now a little overview of our program for the next two hours. Um, I'll start with a very brief introduction of the paper and the, the more setting the scene discussion. Then uh, we'll have the panel discussion where experts will share their tips and their tricks for um, communication with policymakers that is effective and impactful. And that should take us about 30 minutes. Um, then Martin will go through some of our thoughts around the guide itself, its structure, its uh, target audience, etc. And uh, he also explained the breakout sessions. That means that at the top of the hour, uh, we'll break into smaller groups to start brainstorming ideas on, on the guide's contents. And um, you've indicated your preference uh, for the breakout sessions. And as far as I understand, your preference has been... Um, um, met, so you will be in the group that you have selected. Um, each group will have the opportunity to report back to uh, the bigger group and then we'll wrap up and identify next steps. So um, in terms of introduction, now just to give you um, a lay of the land, um, as many of you know, Creative Commons main strategic goal is to influence global policy to ensure better sharing of creative content. and. A big part of that is to uh, try to bring down the copyright barriers to universal access and use and reuse of knowledge and culture, including the cultural heritage that's held in GLAMs or um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, or cultural heritage institutions in general. And that's why our copyright platform, the Creative Commons copyright platform, um, over the course of many months created this policy paper that gives an outline of the main, the main policy issues that are affecting the sharing of cultural heritage. Um, I also want to say that many contributors from our wider CC community outside of the platform also contributed to that paper and um, I'd really like to acknowledge them all for, for their inputs. Um, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at the paper yet, it, it does two main things. First, it gives an overview of the challenges related to copyright uh, that GLAMs face in uh, conducting their legitimate activities. So a lot of things that they should legitimately be able to do, they cannot do because of the way the copyright system works. Um, that goes from preservation, largely through digitization, but also all sorts of sharing of either digital images or data or all sorts of content with their users uh, and permissions that they could give to their users to not only access, but also use and reuse that cultural heritage. So it identifies the challenges and then it provides some insights on what kind of copyright reform we would need to do to address those challenges, especially in the digital environment. And while that's a useful reference document, it's, it can be perceived as quite academic and complex. So the idea is to go from something um, that's quite theoretical into something that's very practical. And so that's why uh, we've organized a panel of experts to figure out, to help us figure out basically, what does a good guide look like? How do we go from uh, something that's complex and that's quite theoretical into something that's concrete, practical, actionable, and that policymakers can really understand and implement to drive policy forward. So at this stage, um, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. Um, and uh, I will start with Maya Drapczyk. Uh, Maya is um, head of policy and advocacy, and she's also a board member at Centrum Cifrowe, uh, a do and think tank based in Poland. Um, Maya is spearheading the development of policy recommendations for the EU-funded uh, indices project. And I'm, uh, I really hope you will be able to share some insights from that experience, Maya. Welcome to the panel. Um, next, we have Ramon Lugo, who's the legislative advisor at the Senate of the Republic of Mexico. 
Um, Ramon has been leading copyright reform efforts in support of access to culture and also upholding the public domain in Mexico. And we really look forward to your insights, Ramon. Um, Chantal English is a copyright and related rights manager at the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. Um, Chantal has been directly involved in implementing the, the WIPO Marrakesh Treaty, uh, enhancing access to copyright works by visually impaired people in Jamaica. And we'll also hear from Mark Foster, who's uh, owner and managing director at Strategic Advisory Management, SRL. Um, Mark's career spans um, several decades in Brussels policymaking, and I'm sure there's a few tricks that um, we can all benefit from uh, hearing from you, Mark. Um, so as I said, welcome everyone to this panel. And without further ado, I would like to kick us off um, perhaps um, by asking you, Maya, if you're up for it, um, maybe you could share from your experience, um, what are some of the lessons or, or what has your experience taught you in terms of uh, effective and impactful policy recommendation drafting, but also communicating that actually um, doesn't end there, but really leads to on the ground action? And uh, the floor is yours, Maya. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for a lovely introduction, Brigitte. It's, uh, it's really um, a pleasure to be here and to be part of these discussions and to be able also to kind of set the scene for a, for a further plan. Um, when I was preparing, like thinking, okay, what should I say? What tips to, uh, to share? I think the first thing that came to my mind is Okay, the first thing you need to say is be open. <laughs> uh, be open in terms of, okay, you want to be heard, that's for sure. But you also, in order to be heard, you need to be, uh, be able to listen, to understand the, uh, the, the, um, the other points, the other perspectives in order to be able to shape the best perspective of yours, to help to strengthen um, your take on things, uh, be it a small thing, be it a major thing, uh, but really listen and being uh, be open to the other perspectives. Make sure that also around yourself, you have the right big circle of people interested in the theme who are active in the field. They not necessarily uh, need to share your opinion. It's even actually more interesting if they don't, <laughs> because that really helps to stream the process as well. It makes, it improves it. It improves the final, uh, the final proposal. Uh, and of course, you need to have your uh, priorities straight. You need to know uh, what you are after. And also, it would be good to prioritize um, your ambitions or the points that you want to make. And I think this in the document that, that you described, the, um, the, the policy paper, I think it's a lovely example that we could, could use for this. So saying, OK, looking at it. So what are the top three most important things that we are really, uh, that we really want to, I don't know, die for? <laughs> or uh, something that we really put up first? And what are the things that we're willing to discuss? Because compromise is also part of the process, uh, especially if you want to achieve um, yeah, something bigger. So making your ambition clear, making your priorities straight. Um, so in other words, be bold. Be visionary, but at the same time, be reasonable, uh, because you want uh, you want to make things work. You want to persuade uh, all the relevant stakeholders, all the the relevant people that you need to talk to, you need to talk with, uh, to make things happen. So another point, uh, and I'm almost there, is just to really understand who these stakeholders are, and once you understand. Uh, make sure that your communication, the language you use, the messages you build, the communication channels you use to, to work with them, that they match the profile of the stakeholders. I'm in Geneva today at the WIPO uh, sessions, uh, so uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, and it's a completely different language that, for example, we use during this session, uh, our meeting here today, and it's okay. We just need to acknowledge that it is like that, and we need to, you know, um, uh, uh, use different discourse for this. So uh, bold and uh, bold and reasonable. Oh yes, and because of that, um, I think you said it yourself, Brigitte. It all it's a process. 
Sometimes it's a very long process. Hello to WIPO and uh, congratulations on the Paracash Treaty. That was, I think, a journey there. So sometimes you get uh, quick wins. Sometimes you need to wait and talk and talk and keep on talking and keep on presenting arguments. Um, use this example, uh, use examples. That's an excellent way to go forward to make people try to understand. Um, so again, it's about prioritizing and it's about understanding what is really super urgent that you need to push forward now and what are the things that can maybe wait a little because it's better for the process. And I think I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> so a few tips from me. Thank you, that was very concise. And uh, well, I think we can follow up with, with one question because I'm curious how, how that applies in your work uh, as head of policy at Centrum Sufrove. Is that something that you do on a daily basis or do you practice what you just preach can you give us a few uh, insights about i do what hope so Other, <laughs> i do hope so otherwise uh, that would be an empty speech but yes as you also mentioned we are part of a uh, horizon 2020 project indices or as our italian coordinator says indices uh we are yeah we still cannot agree on the name uh but the the core of the project the heart of the project is exactly the reach of of um <clears throat> of uh, um, digital culture heritage and kind of empowerment of uh, glam institutions um, trying to support their, their um, digital transformation or the way they approach the digital transformation. And our task as Centrum Zifrove is to exactly to prepare uh, policy recommendations, both on legal and, uh, and kind of a general, more broad scope when it comes to reuse. And, um, how we structure the process, at least that was our ambition, and I hope it is working. We, we try to, we're trying to make it, this is still working progress, through make it an inclusive one. So we first identify the stakeholders uh, within our group, within the consortium who we work, uh, work with. But we immediately said that if we want to uh, represent the sector, not the project only, we need to enlarge the group by experts coming from outside. So we invited a group of people some of, uh, of, uh, of you are part of this process, so thank you very much for this, to, to help us really strengthen the work. And then uh, we, we are shaping the process. So uh, like in iterations, we write, we review, <laughs> we write, we review with different groups. We kicked off the discussion uh, with organizing a number of um, online um, kind of brainstorming sessions with a wider group of experts. Now we are at the time, uh, in the moment when we are uh, drafting the first version of the recommendations. We had a check with the whole consortium and everyone agrees because we need to make sure that we really uh, represent the, uh, the perspective of the group that uh, the kind of ordered us to, uh, to, uh, to be responsible for the task. And our, the, round, the last round be, before we publish the, uh, the recommendations is to talk to the kind of external stakeholders who are not yet part of the process, but are super relevant uh, to making it, returning it into action. And that will be, because this is a EU project, so that will be the, the member states and the European Commission. So we want to have some tests with them, uh, tests, like, yes, testing, uh, a feedback moment with them just to make sure that what we present, we really will be, first of all, recognized uh, that there is a, a um, kind of a signal that, uh, that we are leaving and that we uh, hopefully will be able to be in dialogue. And the last, last, really last part is that when we make everything uh, officially published, we try to communicate the message in the relevant networks. So we, we go to conferences, we'll go to conferences, we'll go to different meetings, um, and again, eager to discuss, again, eager to, to kind of try to uh, support the statements that we're making uh, in both the documents that we're currently drafting. Thanks a lot. I think there's a lot to learn from that experience and you described it so um, clearly that I think that we can definitely identify uh, so, some of the, the, the tips and tricks that will be useful as we uh, draft the guide, but also communicate it and share it with stakeholders over what can be eventually a very long period of time. 
Um, but now we can um, probably change perspectives a little bit. And I'd like to ask you, Ramon, you are a policymaker. You are part of the Mexican Senate and you're involved in driving change and convincing other policymakers um, of, of the benefits of open access to culture. So could you share a little bit uh, your experience in the Mexican Senate and beyond and, and some of the lessons that you've drawn from that experience? Over to you, Ramon. Okay, thank you, Brigitte. First, it's an honor to participate on this workshop. It's my first time in this kind of process. Now, uh, yes, I'm a political advisor and a legislative advisor for the Labour Party in the Senate of Mexico. We have a small group. We have only four senators, and this gives us a different dynamic, uh, even in the, in the way we work because we have uh, some sessions when we uh, try to, to draw the agenda. And this gives me the opportunity to place some, some perspectives and some things that I want to improve and uh, try to convince my, my senators to, to go this way. And this was actually part of the, of the process of the bill we presented uh, to change the federal law of copyright here in Mexico. And OK, what, what I have to say is first, well, we, we, we try to have a, a, an open uh, dialogue with the, with the senators to, to try to convince them to go on open culture and to try to uh, provide this, uh, this bill to reform some articles of the federal copyright law to reduce the excessive validity of the authors' patrimonial rights which are currently in Mexico uh, 100 years uh, af after the author's death. That is uh, it's massive for me, it's, it's, it's too much. And to try to establish the term to 70 years, years post-mortem. Uh, that was actually the first part of this. And uh, to try to make it uh, uh, consistent with the international treaties, uh, which Mexico is party as a USMCA now that has actually established a validity of no less than 70 years post-mortem uh, for the copyright. So we first have this uh, dialogue and then we have this issue because my main, uh, what I do is actually consumer policy more than open culture or more than copyright policy. So I had to look forward for experts in order to review what, what you know. And that's actually the way I, I came up with uh, Creative Commons. And I tried to verify what you do. And then I contacted uh, Brigitte by Twitter without knowing or having any, any uh, contact before. And then we had a, a, a really good dialogue with uh, uh, Cryptic Commons Chapter Mexico, and we started to, you know, to have some sessions to to talk about the the copyright law in Mexico. Now, we presented this on December the seventh of two thousand twenty one. Uh, two of our senators uh, presented this this bill uh, on the Congress on the Senate, and. It hasn't moved at all. Uh, what I have learned with this process is, is some things. We have a strong opposition to this kind of reform in Mexico right now. We have had uh, in, in, in the last years some, uh, some reforms to, to a copyright law. And this is a very, a very political sensitive issue in Mexico today. On June 2020, as part of the harmonization of the national legal framework with the treaty between Mexico and the United States and Canada, uh, the Senate approved reforms to various legal provisions to update the protection of works of authorship in the digital environment. So this closed uh, the, the possibilities. In November 2021, the Senate approved the federal law for the protection of cultural heritage of indigenous and Afro-Mexican people and communities. Okay, that's fine. In February 2022, the Senate approved to recognize safeguard and establish the rights and obligation of literally translators in the federal copyright. 
And even if, if these are very different reforms uh, and the bill af that affects copyrights in Mexico is seen as a possible threat right now. What I have seen is uh, we have uh, very strong groups that are against some modifications or some reforms in the copyright law. And I have learned it is important to carry out uh, mapping the actors and recognize the current condition do not ex exist to extend the exceptions to them right now. Two days after uh, we presented the bill, we had a meeting with some of the, 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 the groups against this. They were artists and people in the music business because they said this, uh, this kind of modifications or reforms to the copyright are not necessary because, uh, well, as, as they express it, the protection of authors should be extended and that shortening the time for a work to enter to the public domain only benefits television stations and venues, in addition to generating unfair competition to authors. In Mexico, we, we, the Supreme Court hasn't said what is uh, you know, on the top, if access to culture or copyright law. So we have this gray area where the main uh, argument is that copyright law is a human law. That's what they said to me. And we are trying to dialogue with them about this, but I don't see much openness to to speak uh, about uh, a real change or to reducing the time uh, for, for the copyright in Mexico right now, to be honest with you. We, we know uh, another senator from, uh, uh, Senator Antares presented another uh, uh, reform and I think it's still uh, pending. And as far as I have spoken with the, with the technical secretary on the commission, uh, I don't see that uh, passing through to because uh, what I what I know now is that uh, this uh, well the people on the cultural commission has been here for around 27 years so they have seen these reforms that have uh, increased the time from se uh, 75 to 100 years and they are not expecting to change that uh, right now. Mm -hmm. oh, it goes back to what. Mm -hmm. so, so what I think we have to do is uh, keep talking, mm -hmm. keep speaking with them, uh, trying to make some pressure uh, with, with the civil society and trying to, to put the, the topic on the agenda and mm -hmm. to keep the pressure on. Because if not, if it's not seen, it will not be changed in any time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I speak it well because uh, I'm not that uh, mm -hmm. speaker oh, in English. It was so. very clear. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think it goes back to what Maya was saying that sometimes the conversations with those that you disagree with are far more interesting. But there's a lesson here that um, we shouldn't give up. Um, that it might be difficult, but the fight is worth the uh, the that the, the the outcomes are are worth the fight. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I will um, ask Mark maybe to share some of your lessons before then giving the floor to Chantal to, to close up our panel. So over to you, Mark, and thank you very much, Ramon. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, it's very difficult to follow up to such excellent uh, presentations by my colleagues there. Um, let me introduce myself quickly. So my name is Mark Foster. I'm an I'm independent consultant uh, based in Brussels. Uh, I've been working on EU and UK uh, legislation and policy for over 20 years now. The first part of my career, I was in the public sector, where I worked in the European Parliament and then for the British government. And then the second part of my career, I've been on the other side, uh, so working in the private sector uh, as, a, as a consultant, but also uh, in an in-house role for government relations. So I've seen effective communication and bad communication on both sides. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a, a few tips and tricks on, on what to do, or maybe, maybe what what to avoid uh, from, from my experience. Um, I tried to, as I was preparing this session, I tried to think of a way of, uh, of making it um, memorable, at least in, in people's minds. I think that there's one thing, if there's one thing you should have to remember, policy making is, is about people. It's people, it's personal in that sense, and it's about building trust. 
So, you know, um, I think the comments before made it quite clear, you know, people have different perspectives, people will be coming at things from different angles. You need to understand that, and understand what their competing priorities are so that you can try and encourage them to, you know, see your perspective as well. And, and, and that really comes having that contact, having that network, you build up over time, you become a, a trusted advisor or a trusted part of the policy making process. And that's something which is very hard to earn that trust, takes a lot of time and, and very quickly can be lost if you do something that, you know, seen as being too controversial. So I think that's just w one thing to remember. Um, there are five, there are five things I'd like to say in the five P's. I try to keep it relatively simple, the five P's. So first one is people. You need to adapt your message to when you're speaking to different people. So uh, I'm using examples from the EU, but I think it will probably be something that Ramon and Maria would also uh, attest to in their own work. Um, you would speak very differently when you're trying to communicate with a civil servant and a technocrat, as you would when you're speaking to a politician, the senators that Ramon was mentioning. You need to speak to all of the players, but you need to make sure your argument is tailored to the right audience. So, for example, if you wanted to speak to a, uh, someone from the European Commission, you might want to produce a lot of evidence, some data, you know, explaining what the content is quite technical. If you're speaking to a politician, you want to explain that the, on an emotional level what, why the issue that you're uh, talking about is important, what it means for the people that have elected them. Uh, and obviously the arguments that you use would be, would be very different, different in, in each case. So people, that's the first P. Second P is process. And, and Maria touched upon this uh, very nicely. Processes are sometimes very long, very complex, particularly in Europe when you have 27 countries trying to bring things together. But it's really important that you understand the process because different people have different roles in the process. Uh, and so you need to make sure that you're speaking to the right person at the right time and you understand their role. Um, try also, uh, from my experience, don't always try and have the ideal solution because you could spend ages making the brilliant, a brilliant position paper or having exactly the right thing from your community. But if that is not what the other people in the policy making process are thinking about, you will struggle to get that through. So don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, there are some good examples of how you can uh, use the process. Often there are consultations, you know, where uh, policymakers are thinking about what they want to do. Always try and use those. It gives you an opportunity afterwards to be able to then have a follow-up meeting, try and build on those contacts that you've already made. And it also allows you to put something down in writing. That's an important first step to creating those personal relationships that, that I mentioned, which are important. Um, also, in terms of the process, there's no point trying to call for something if the policymakers have just done something a couple of weeks or months ago, or if they've already said, no, no, we're gonna do that in five years time because there's a review. So again, you, you could be interested in one policy or one file, but it, where does that sit in the broader context? Because you need, you need to be aware of that. So people, process. Third P is the policy itself. Um, don't underestimate your role in that process, but don't overestimate it either. Um, politicians and policymakers will be speaking to a very wide range of different stakeholders that will have lots of different views. Um, so, you know, you need to be relevant uh, and you need to explain to them why they should be listening to your arguments. From my experience, um, when you're doing written papers, if you can't get it on one page, you will, you will lose it, at least with the political audience. You need to be able to be very concise, say what the problem is, say why it's a problem, and then explain how you have an alternative solution for them, which can be relevant and constructive from the policymaker's perspective. Uh, a, a bad example uh, of, of, uh, of this on policy is where you just suggest you should delete the whole thing, or you're proposing 20 pages of legal text, uh, that would be very difficult for policymakers, particularly politicians, to accept. Try and look at the text, try and make a small amount of minimum changes, but by doing so, step by step, incrementally, you get closer to where you want to be. Fourth P is prioritize or priorities. Again, this is about uh, remembering where your role is in the policymaking process. The uh, people that you are speaking to will have uh, lots of other competing uh, interests that uh, they have to listen to. Uh, and so it's al always important to try and put your message in a broader context. What does this mean for 
uh, jobs or growth or access to culture or how will that help better uh, the individuals that the policymakers are trying to, to represent. So short, sharp uh, written communication or oral communication is always uh, preferable to very long papers or very complex ideas. And then my final P, Bridget, number five is politics. Um, policy and politics go hand in hand. Some people prefer one, some people prefer the other. But if you don't understand the political dynamics, uh, you, you won't succeed, even if you have a, a, a very good uh, position that you want to, um, to, to uh, articulate. In an EU context, obviously, we have the European Parliament that represents the people, and then the European Council, which represents the member states. And again, it's important to know the dynamics between these institutions as they work together to try and get a joint position. You need to understand the, the different political uh, uh, visions in, in the different aspects of, of the policymaking process to avoid a situation whereby your position gets kind of negotiated out in, in that complex process. And, and, that, and that's a very uh, obviously long and complex uh, way of uh, working, but it's important to you know, evolve your message as things go because you need to keep relevant and you need to show that you're uh, following the, the dynamics of the negotiation. And if you follow those five Ps or as many of them as you can, hopefully you will have a, a good basis to be able to do some effective communications. Thanks a lot, Bridget. That's it from me, but happy to take questions if, if people have them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much. It seems like you gave us a fail-proof recipe for success. Just follow the five Ps. One thing you shouldn't do is write a 24 or 27 page uh, policy paper like, a, <laughs> like we did. So no, um, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, Chantal, uh, over to you. Is that also your experience? Have you, have you come across uh, the five Ps in your, <laughs> in the, in your work at Typo? Yes, good morning. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Bridget. Happy to be here and happy to hear from the rest of the panelists' beautiful expressions. And certainly, I can relate to all of you, <laughs> the five Ps, of course, <laughs> certainly. And also want to add, when I heard um, Mark saying about the one page, I totally agree. When you have, when it's very clear, so the first thing I looked at was purpose. So you have to clearly state i also have a p as well mark but mine is is purpose so state clearly what is being proposed don't beat around the bush just go directly to the point just say this is what we want this is what we're looking for make it succinct in very simple language sometimes as writers we tend to use elaborate concepts and big words trying to think that that would persuade but because i'm um, policy makers really don't have a lot of time they want to just look at the documents and be able to say, okay, this is what they're saying. And so one of the things that I see work as well is when we have bullet points. So you have it as simple as possible. You have point one, point two, point three. So you state clearly what it is that you want and your intention. And I've heard the keyword um, be open. Yes, say exactly what you want, you know, because that is where you're going to move forward to the next step. If it is that it's rejected and you can go back to the drawing table and say, okay, I can now adjust this to suit this circumstance or this situation. Also, in looking in working with you know different um, treaties and so forth, we always look at the background, uh, do some groundwork, some research to see what other countries have done, uh, how they've incorporated it. I think one of the things that policymakers like to hear is that other countries have done this. For what's the success story? So it's very important that yes, you know you have all your research and all your document, everything put together. But in presenting it, I think, you know, do that one pager and then have an appendix so that if it is that they ask for further information, then you can send those supporting information to them, which would make it very important. And I also heard collaboration coming up um, with the, from a different um, panelist. They spoke about collaborations is very important. I realized that having consultations, working with different interest groups, the persons who uh, whatever policy you're putting in place will, will directly affect that's very important. You want to know their feedback. You want to know what they're thinking, what their positions are. When we're working with Marrakesh, Jamaica has a special unit, special education unit in the Ministry of Education that deals with persons with special needs. And so 
it was easy because from 1927, this organization was our own. And so when we started looking at Marrakesh and how we could implement it in our local legislation, we saw where we already had institutions who were, and community and bodies who were already lobbying for you know, easy access to these works. And so it made it easier. So having consultations, you know, looking at how this, this policy is going to in, uh, affect or what possible implications this policy can have. So we're looking at an interna in the an international arena, we're looking at a regional level, we're looking at a local government, and what politicians like to hear, as we heard from Mark Maria Ramon, is that we want to ensure that you bring across the benefits that this policy is going to bring. Because if it is that there is not going to be a benefit and it's not going to look good for the politicians to say, okay, hey, during our tenure, we did this, we accomplished this, then that's not, they're going to be like, oh, this can wait. So you have to point out the urgency and how important this policy is going to affect to the government and how they are going to look good. So I think that is very, very important. Uh, so make it succinct. Remember, people focus, as um, my fellow panelists said, and just be clear. Say what you want. Be succinct. Sometimes you may not always get yay when you go for the first time, but just go at it again and keep going and keep going. Keep consulting. Keep going back and just make it succinct. Uh, put the points out. Continue to consult and just go at it. <laughs> Those are my, my few tips, Bridget. Oh, thank you so much. I, again, a lot of uh, nuggets of, of information here that I'm sure the, the participants are eager to, uh, to take on board and, and perhaps even uh, try out in, in all of our uh, policy efforts. I think that um, it's been really valuable to hear how on the ground these things work. Um, I like the idea of the one pager with simple bullet points, but I'm guilty of writing those lengthy papers with a lot of complicated words. So uh, I think it requires quite some discipline to maybe uh, get out of your own comfort zone and really take the policymakers perspective and, and, and put yourself in those shoes in order to see the world from their place. Um, we have a few minutes, we're running a little bit late, but I think we have a few minutes for one or two questions from the audience for our panelists. Is, are there any from the audience, something you would like to ask to Ramon, Maya, Chantal, or Mark? Either take the floor or ask in the chat. I saw that Mark, there was a lot of interest for uh, your five Ps uh, and we should call them the six Ps, right? Adding purpose, as Chantal mentioned. Are there any questions? I have, I have a question. Martin, go ahead. So our our goal here in this, this group, running a bit ahead of what we're doing, is to put something down on paper for some of you, the policymakers. So my question would be is, what would you want to see written down by such a large international community as ours um, to help further your work? And maybe this is mostly for Ramon and Chantal, I think. Take the floor, Ramon or Chantal, please uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask if you could, the question can be rephrased, um, Martin, so, so I can properly address it. I think I missed a yeah. point of it, right? Yeah, so, so the, the goal of our, um, our, uh, our working group here that, that, that you uh, are a, a visitor of is to um, make a guide for policymakers as yourselves yes. uh, internationally um, to further the, uh, the, uh, the access to GLAM materials. So my question would be, as a policymaker, what would you like to see in those such, those kind of documents? Because these are not policy papers. These are more on the abstract level, whereas the things that you just discussed. So I'm just curious if what you would like to see in those kind of documents. Okay, all right, sure, awesome. No, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so again, yeah, I still am gonna rephrase the purpose. So still state what it is that you want, what it is that you are bringing forth and what is the idea that you have and once it is that you clearly state 
to us, uh, what are your intentions? Then we know we're in a better position to say, okay, this is where you want to go. This is your interest. Many of our stakeholders um, or collective management organizations, many of our um, visually impaired societies, ministry of education, different persons, different sectors, they would write to us and say, we are having this challenge. This is what we want to have sessions. We want to have, sometimes it is them that reach out to us. Sometimes just a letter to say, this is our concern. This is our challenge. And then we will have to now do some research now to see how we now can advance cabinet submissions to get to the point where we can have bills and approved by parliament for them to be enacted. So once, so for us, it's just simple, write a letter, send us a call, say you want to have a consultation and we are yeah. ready. So start the discourse, however simple, if it's an email, we'd like to have something, an, a letter, something that formalizes it. Just say what you want. And once you say that, we will now do some research to see how we can best facilitate the process as well as looking at what other persons have done and then make that necessary link to move forward the point. Sometimes it's something that it's, you know, not a grave concern that needs to be addressed right now, but then sometimes when we look at what you want, we're like, yes, this is definitely something that we need to push. And so we at the back will do everything that we can once you recognize that this is something that needs to be done. Thank you. Martin. If I may say, okay, you make a really good effort when you do a, a, a really deep paper and you have, uh, I don't know, statistics and everything, but we, uh, as, as, you know, as advisors, we look forward for, uh, like Mark said, bullets, the small uh, bits of information that can sell your product in order we, we keep going and digging in what you're trying to say. So I will say this, this, you know, this final part of conclusions and uh, policy recommendations is quite important. And if you have a catchphrase, as Mark said, that here, his five P or something like that, where you can uh, make a, a small resume of what you are trying to say and what is your purpose, as Chantal said, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's called cool because that way uh, we can quickly make, a, I don't know, a small card for our boss and try to say uh, to tell him why it's important to go further with this uh, with this uh, with this with this topic and I think that is it's really great and in order to uh, answer Abigail uh, uh, question on the chat to Ramon and Mark is there initial shock to overcome after introducing a new policy. I think it depends. If you are uh, changing something that it has ha ha haven't changed in a lot of time, it might be. And it depends on how it's made. For example, in Mexico, you can just introduce the bill without uh, going, you know, and speaking forward to all the the senators, and that act reduces the the impact of uh, of, of the bills. That is a way to to place. Uh, 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 reform and it depends if you have uh, made a prior effort to speak with other policymakers in order to introduce the bill and what is the opposition you are you are trying you, you are having and what is uh, which actors you are going to have to speak with uh, so sometimes it's real smooth and sometimes you are beaten up by the media and uh, well you try to keep your job and that's everything but uh, yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes now you have to to follow up the the bills and that's it. Thanks, Brigitte. If if I may, I fully agree with Ramon's comments there, and I'll try and answer Frederic's question and Abigail's together. So I mean, into Frederic, yeah, I think there is there is different uh, diverse ways of doing things because obviously politics and policymaking is a cultural thing as well, which is different in different parts of the world because of our histories and because of the way things are done. So um, I think a lot of the messages that we've been sharing, there's, there's some commonality around you know, what makes good interaction and, and, and what will go down well in a political environment, but how that's done is, is also very local. 
And, and, and that becomes back to how do you make something relevant for the person you're speaking to? Whether you're a civil servant or whether you're a political actor, ultimately uh, these people are trying to make policy and, and, and politics is the way to make policy and laws to govern the, the people that they represent. So you know, that will be very diff different in different parts of the world. And at least for Europe and, and, and the area of the world that I know best from a political perspective, there shouldn't be too much shocks because the system is so complex and everyone knows what's going to happen anyway. <laughs> you have a consultation and then there's a process where the commission come up with a proposal and there's the parliament and then there's a council. So there's loads of people you can speak to and there's always annual work programs, multi-annual work programs. So in theory, there shouldn't be too much that is a, a complete surprise. Having said that, there are always you know, things that you, we don't expect. And unfortunately, at the moment, given the geopolitical concerns, there's lots of policy in Europe that's changing very, very rapidly and things are happening that we wouldn't have thought you know, only six months ago. But in general terms, the, the process is complex and long, but it's normally quite predictable. Thank you. Thank you for your questions from the audience. and. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists now because unfortunately the panel has come to an end. Um, so a virtual round of applause for Marc, Ramon, Chantal and Maya. You've shared incredible insights. Um, it's really, I've learned so much and I'm sure our participants have as well. Uh, we tried to capture, Kemi and Oni are, are here trying to capture all the good advice that you were able to share with us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to share that further and most importantly apply it as we develop uh, some guidance for policymakers that is um, concise, sharp, purposeful, and that really speaks to their perspective and how they see um, what benefits the people. So round of applause. Thank you very much. This concludes our panel. And um, I would like now to pass over the mic to Martin, who's going to lead us to the next part of our program, which is about really what, what we tend to do and what shape we want this guide to have, uh, which is, of course, subject to change, given all the good advice that we've had now. Um, Martin, you're going to also give a little bit of explanation on how the breakout sessions will uh, work and uh, the breakout rooms will be open in just about uh, six minutes or so. Um, so without further ado, please go ahead, Martin. Thank you. Um, it's very difficult for me to follow up to such an excellent panel and such uh, in, in a good discussion already. Um, so um, after written, having written the policy paper, the lengthy policy paper, um, the next step in, in, in our process is uh, to write a uh, creative common guide for policymakers, and this is a bit of a, a different than, than we usually do because usually we write the policy papers right uh, so this is specifically developed for the policymakers themselves so the members of government um, the, the people who are responsible for devising the plans the policy the rules and the laws etc um, and uh, in our mind uh, this uh, this document um, needs to be co-written with the entire community. Um, so we have a, a group of uh, four coordinators, uh, three, three or four coordinators who have already been introduced, of course. Um, and we have an, a basic ID um, that we wanna uh, uh, try in, uh, in this group and also uh, further on discuss in the, in the, in the breakout sessions um, where we have a five part document basically that starts with uh, background concept and key issues. Um, then it takes the, the policy uh, documents that we have already written and makes them into more succinct policy recommendation, annotated policy recommendations. Uh, and then we wanna have a section on advocacy skills. Um, and um, um, as I'll also said in the panel, uh, we need to have case studies. We need to have evidence um, in, uh, of course, and addendum uh, of any uh, in any way um, and a uh, we intend to write a uh, an online global mapping tool for um, to keep track of which policy recommendations are already uh, implemented in which jurisdictions so that the policy makers themselves don't um, uh, come into 
go, go to their boss and say, I want this. And then the boss said, well, we already have it. That, that's not what we want, of course. So we need to have an, an accurate map of that, uh, which is going to be a, a big challenge to us. So that is the, the, the basic idea of the, um, of, of the document. Um, have I said that right, Brigitte? All right, I see you nodding. All right. Um, so our next step is uh, is is to really start this document and to start working with you uh, on that uh, that guide for policymakers. And that's what we're going to do in uh, the breakout sessions. Now, let me get it in front of me. Um, there are four breakout sessions, um, and you have already. Uh, chosen one of the, the breakout sessions uh, beforehand, and I think that you are already assigned to them as well. Um, the first one is on open culture in an ideal world. Uh, the second one on open culture in our current world. The third one is on bridging the gap between the current and the ideal. And the last one is on the new horizons, like artificial intelligence uh, in copyright and cultural heritage. Um, these are all parts of the, the, the thinking that we need to do to write this, uh, this larger document. Um, so um, being in those sessions, uh, we can help brainstorm um, how, to, how, how, to, how to identify the challenges uh, that we come across and how to overcome them. So um, given that introduction, I think we can start in the breakout sessions and then it will be a small introduction of each, uh, each breakout session themselves and how they operate. Thank you very much, Martin. I'll just say that uh, each group uh, will have the opportunity now uh, in about 10 minutes to report back on your discussions. What are some of the main issues, main points that, um, that you discuss and what would you like to share with, uh, with everyone else? And um, perhaps we could start with Shana. Um, since that's the group I was in, um, I'll hand over to you and then Shana, you can pass over to one of our uh, other facilitators once you're done. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just be real quick. Um, our, our group was talking about uh, open culture in our current world. So sort of what are the problems and the hurdles and the challenges that we face? And we came up with a handful of major takeaways. Um, the first being that copyright is really complex. This is not news to anyone here, I'm sure. Um, you know, even this sort of labyrinth of exceptions and limitations and what you can do and what you can't do and trying to figure out if something is even eligible for copyright or still in copyright or is it in the public domain or who is the rights holder um, is a real problem. And then it differs across different jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another challenge that we noted is that GLAM institutions in general tend to be more risk averse um, so, for instance, there might be certain uses that are allowable under an exception like fair use or fair dealing, but some institutions may decide, well, it's kind of a gray area and we don't want to take the risk. So this can limit some of the sharing that claim institutions do. Um, we also noted an interesting sort of tension between sometimes there's a difference between what GLAMs feel comfortable doing within their own institutions versus what they'll advise their users to do. Uh, so I'm a librarian in the United States and I know certain archives and museums sometimes will have patrons or users or customers ask us copyright questions about the things in our collection. And there are certain uses that, you know, we might feel comfortable doing internally, but that we may not, you know, it's kind of a risk management question and we may not feel comfortable telling just a general member of the public who may not have as deep an understanding as we do that yes, this is okay or not okay. Um, so there's an interesting sort of double standard there. Is there a way to make our practices more transparent or convey that information? Um, and then the final thing we talked about was just how do we, um, talk about the relevance of copyright and open culture in times of crisis. Um, so, you know, there are so many crises in the world today and even before, long before today, um, there have been wars and plagues and pandemics. Um, there's always some sort of pressing immediate need. Um, so how do we tell a story around open culture and sharing cultural heritage that makes policymakers actually care about it and rise to the level of something that should be a priority and something that they want to actually take action 
um, for. So uh, I'll stop there, Brigitte, if I missed anything. Nope, all right. So I'm going to um, kick it over now to let me see what uh, some of the other ones we had. Um, I think we sh should go next to uh, Kemi with the open culture in sort of an ideal world. So we talked about the current world, Kemi can talk about the ideal world and then we can kind of go from there. It sounds great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So I will try to summarize, um, to summarize the, the debate that we had in our working group. We actually we were still in discussion when uh, when we had to come back. So I I would I would do my best. So uh, we've started with um, the fact that we believe that uh, GAN's, GAN's institution should uh, be able to actually continue their mission in the digital environment. So it would mean to adapt. Um, uh, the Lego framework around to be able to make sure that they could continue their their um, to fulfill their mission. Um, directly, we started to discuss uh, copyright terms, uh, discussion about the reduction of the copyright uh, term of protection. Um, we've discussed how, how, um, how much we should reduce it, and we've talked about a couple of decades and even maybe actually yes than a decade and with a renewable options so basically we would have a couple of years and then we would be able to have a registration system uh, and to be able to renew uh, copyright protection a uh, copyright term uh, oh yeah copyright protection um, some some members of the group mentioned that they would like to have all government uh, supporting uh, CC license and tools for sharing content in game institution to have like uh, policies at that level um, um, other members mentioned also that we should uh, recognize the right of creators empowering them to uh, choose CC license and um, and that's it. Uh, we've also mentioned preserve as uh, a capacity for uh, digi uh, digital online preservation. So uh, allowing all uh, game institutions to be able to, to make uh, digital copies um, internationally because at the moment it's uh, not, not uh, they don't, we don't have an international legal framework for this. Uh, let me see what else. Um, also to be able to share their own material um, to own their own material and to be able to share them. So it, we come back to the uh, digital uses. Um, some members have uh, uh, expressed uh, an interest into uh, switching the system from an exclusive right system to a, um, a non-exclusive right system by principle. Uh, and also that activities undertaken um, uh, for profits um, that we would um, that we would actually we would uh, let me think how to phrase this that gam gam institution activities would be um, excluded uh, uh, from 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 would have an exception for 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 uh, continuing their mission. And as well, like the last item, and I'm trying to summarize this in very short time, it's, uh, I think it's something, it's a topic that we've already discussed with a lot of people here, uh, the protection of traditional knowledge and the better sharing discussion that we've already had. So basically sharing, yes, and but in a certain framework to make sure that we are respectful and that we uh, have a, a better framework for sharing. That's it for my group. Thanks. And um, Shanna, I'm following your path. Uh, who did you say it would be after? Um, my guess is probably Martin with bridging the gap between that current and ideal. And then we'll go to Emine with the way out there on the horizons. <laughs> so um, thanks for uh, the great discussion with my group. Um, I had a an amazing group with a lot of uh, experience and um, um, a lot of perspectives. Uh, one of the perspectives is don't mention the C word when you try to bridge the gap. Other perspective was embrace the C word and make it friendly for everyone. So there are a lot of um, ways of uh, of bridging the gap. Uh, but if some things came uh, came back from the multiple perspectives, also from the multiple places in the world where the where uh, the group participated from. Uh, and it was uh, about stories and data. 
So you need to, if you want to bridge the gap, you need to have good stories, good ambassadors, not, not even locally, but can also be international ambassadors, could be institutions, but could also be um, jurisdictions who have, who, who, done, who have done things differently, uh, but institutions that you want to follow maybe. Um, so good stories and good data and um, bring that to the, the policy maker. Uh, the policymaker themselves don't have the time to get the right stories and the right data. Um, so also um, do their homework for them. That's also one of the sentences uh, that was used. Uh, it's not only the, about the policymakers themselves, but we should really consider um, a, a wider audience um, as like the assistants, the aides, the staffers, etc., of the, the policymakers. Uh, and it's also about if you want to bridge the gap between what we have and what we want. Uh, it's about, if you wanna have this discussion, it's about those choosing your forum, uh, choose the audience that you wanna communicate to, just like as, as in the panel, uh, the, the, the five Bs, um, to, um, uh, to see what, what really um, uh, convinces or convinces your audience, not only the policymakers, but also the general public, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that is a reasonably good overview of my uh, my group. And again, it was an amazing discussion. Thank you. And now to Emin about the future. Thank you. So as they mentioned, this is about artificial intelligence and future. Uh, and I also had many great uh, people giving great input. Um, first of all, uh, we started with uh, discussing uh, the challenges and opportunities of AI and perspective of corporate uh, studies of AI generated output, creative output. So with that, uh, actually there was a very good uh, discussion on that because uh, we, we basically discussed that we should see AI as a tool, uh, not something with an agency. Uh, so then we, then we see it as a tool, uh, the argument becomes very simple. So like not creating a copyright, uh, uh, not granting a copyright status or not, that there is not a discussion on that. So that was one of the ideas. Um, also another perspective regarding that was uh, bringing the perspective of AI concerning agents, especially in a human in the loop uh, factor is really important. Uh, so these are uh, the challenges and actually the perspective uh, of the copyright status. And regarding the opportunities, um, we discussed that using AI tools uh, can help Glenn to find bias in archive object descriptions. And of course, uh, the AI uh, needs to be programmed uh, properly. And then we moved on discussing how we can better assist policymakers uh, to, um, for them to have better understanding uh, regarding progressive copyright reform. And with that, uh, we discussed that we need better articulation of the concepts, new technologies uh, uh, to policymakers, explaining the potential risks and concerns for people, jobs, uh, society, et cetera, while explaining the final outcome. So instead of uh, approaching uh, the recommendations from a technical perspective, uh, it's better to actually focus on consequences uh, while com communicating our recommendations to them. Uh, another, uh, another thing that we uh, discussed that maybe we should convey to policymakers is uh, there should be a policy revision concerning GLAM institutions uh, regarding open data and licensing and different implications on cross-sourcing citizen science projects. And uh, we also discussed that this could uh, help uh, digital scholars as well. And lastly, uh, we also uh, discussed that how can cultural heritage institutions could help uh, policymakers to make better policies. But uh, we concluded that there's actually just not enough knowledge regarding what AI technologies entail. And because uh, many uh, people in GLAM industries are not aware of the benefits or risks, uh, barriers in moving barriers or ethical considerations of these technologies. So there is a big uh, lack of knowledge and confidence. So it makes it harder for them to actually support policymakers. So there is a lack of training regarding that. And with that, I think that was uh, the overall summary of our uh, discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Emine. And thank you, Martin and Shana and Kemi for all your summaries and all the work that you did facilitating those groups. Um, I think, again, I'd like to offer a round of applause because uh, it's really been um, wonderful to be able to, to cooperate with you in, in making this event uh, possible. And, uh, and thank you again for leading the conversations and the, in the breakout sessions. Are there any questions for our facilitators? before we move to the last part of the of the workshop, which is the wrap up. Do you have any questions for Emine, Martin, Shana, Kemi on what happened in those groups? I don't see any. So that means that we can swiftly move to the last part of the workshop, which is really about wrapping up and um, thinking about possible next steps. Um, so I'll start by saying that uh, it was a very packed program. I think we were quite ambitious with having a panel and breakout sessions and mixing it all together, I think made it for, uh, made, made quite a, um, uh, an intense two hours um, and I, I am grateful for those of you who managed to, to stay on until the end of this, uh, of this workshop. Um, it was really wonderful to hear from our panelists. Um, they really had different perspectives, but some of uh, many of the advice that they gave was actually converging into some kind of consensus that uh, there might be different strategies, but um, if we want to, as advocates, advocates convey complex messages to policymakers, uh, we have to be reminded that they are not necessarily experts like we are, and they need very simple language uh, that resonates with them and that where they can really see um, the benefits. So, uh, we shouldn't shy away from really overstating what the benefit are, what the benefits are, and not bury it under a lot of jargon and lengthy documents. So to me, that was a major takeaway. Um, I also really like the different various approaches of, around the C word, which uh, stands for copyright. Um, I, th I think that there, there could be a whole workshop on whether we should use the word copyright in advocacy or not. Um, but perhaps this is something that we can uh, continue to ponder on as we um, as we try to promote better sharing of cultural heritage and seeing copyright as a major challenge. Um, how how can we uh, make that point uh, clear and relevant without immediately going into the complexities of copyright? Um, so what are the next steps? Uh, well, first we will be uh, publishing a, a recap uh, of this uh, workshop. We'll be sharing the video recording so that it's available to you. Uh, this should be coming up in the next few days. Um, hopefully the key points uh, will be highlighted uh, to really uh, give those that were not able to come, but also for you as a reminder of what, um, what might be the main takeaways. Uh, I'll also share Mark's slides. There was a lot of interest in the chat and I think from many participants to see them. So I will be sharing them on uh, our Creative Commons policy mailing list. So if you are not yet on that list, I will share the link immediately in the chat. Um, uh, up. I'll do it right now so that you all have that link. And I'm sorry about the background noise. Um, uh, okay, and so we will also use today's learnings. Um, so everything that has been said in the panel and in the uh, breakout sessions to actually prepare a first draft of the guide um, based on the tips that we got, but also the substantive discussions. Uh, and that first draft will then be shared for public consultations, uh, to generate more conversations. So we're hoping to have more of these uh, meetings where we uh, can really have a, a flowing organic conversation with you. Um, and then uh, possibly also some co-drafting sessions for those of you who are interested in, um, in, in really rolling up your sleeves and, and, and participating in the creation of the guide. 
we'll organize sessions where uh, you'll be invited to do so. Um, before we part, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists, to our facilitators, um, but also to people without whom this workshop would not be happening today. Um, this is thanks to the work behind the scenes of people you have heard or seen or, 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 or not noticed. Uh, that's Kat Drew and uh, Oni and Yukim, who are my colleagues, and we wouldn't be here today. So I want to say my heartfelt thanks to them for organizing this workshop. And um, I'll be sharing the link again. I'm sorry, I, I will make sure that we can all have access to the policy mailing list. And um, with this, I would like to conclude, wish you all a great rest of your day and please stay in touch and I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.